Hi, you're listening to Avenue Insights. Information relating to investment approaches or individual investments should not be construed as advice or endorsement. Any views expressed in this podcast are based on information available at the time and are subject to change without notice. So I thought for, for today's conversation, um, there there's a number of things that you know have happened in the last couple of months in terms of um, how governments have responded to the virus. And I think the one thing that's come up in some of the conversations I've been having with clients the last few months is just this issue of look at all the levels of debt, both in Canada and the U.S., and how sustainable is this response to COVID? Um, we're seeing the debt, debt numbers both in the U.S. and Canada sort of shoot higher. So I thought it would be a good conversation to have in terms of the bond market perspective with these levels of debt. And so maybe kind of distill, you know, how we got to this point from from the response to COVID and, and, and maybe throw a little bit of analysis behind the bond market perspective to these levels of government debt. Yeah, in sure. I mean, it's astounding the amount of level of debt issuance or the amount of money being thrown at this. And it's appropriate. Like, so we don't have the time right now to figure out if this was a right government policy or a wrong government policy. But I think everyone could agree. You just got to kind of, this is unprecedented. So you throw it at the wall and hope something sticks, which it has. The economy has actually provided, other than certain sectors, the economy's done quite well. Mm. Uh, Liquidity's there. The markets are functioning. So that's great. Mm. So now we started thinking about, okay, if we are running in, say, Canada, uh, 300 and 350 billion dollar deficit which was forecast to be a 20 billion dollar deficit and then we look at the u.s which i don't even know what the numbers are but with this new stimulus package it's got to be have to be five trillion or something close like that. to it with that yeah these numbers are so huge that we the one thing that all of us are trying to figure out is when we have the time to care and to analyze and to figure out well so what does this mean are they going to pay back ever the money and that's where it gets into the the real unknowns. So we know for probably a couple of years. So let's let's back it up. For in Canada, as most of uh, our audience knows, or maybe not, that the debt to GDP, which is always what we talk about when it comes to indebtedness of countries, the debt to GDP in Canada is around in federally is around thirty percent, thirty two percent. It's probably going up to. Uh, after this year, 50%? Is that? I think somewhere fair? in the range, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a hugely alarming. But on a relative scale, globally, that's still not that high. Whereas the US is, and you can quote me on this, or you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. If we were at 6 70% debt to GDP, we're close to 100% right now. Or are we at 60? It was, so it was closer to like high 70s, but oh, it's okay. at 100 right now. Okay, so it's so 100. It's at 100 right now. And then in, in, just for context, Japan is at 300 last year, 300 debt to GDP. And I'm sure with Japan now, it's got to be at 350% debt to GDP. So when you look at that as an investing landscape, it's like, why would I buy uh, yen Yen denominated bonds at zero percent. Yeah, zero percent with horrible demographics, no growth. But what the biggest surprise in my investment career, and it's over thirty-two years, I just don't understand why pension plans and agencies buy Japan debt. Now, of course, you have to allocate to it, but why is there not stress to the system? Because I don't know how they're going to pay it off. Now it was it did make sense back in the day because they had net savings. They were they were funding it internally. So that I get. Yeah, so if you're funded internally through through the post office, that's what is kind of like a savings arm in the in in Japan and um, internal asset internal uh, assets are covering all the payments, but that stopped about I'm thinking about 10 years ago. So they have to get outside investors to cover the deficit. So I just don't know when, we, when the, the day comes where there's a buyer strike and then rates do what they do or there's a default or there's a run on the currency. And, and the problem is it's all a relative game. So relative to Canada, to U.S., we're in much better shape. The problem is when there are in that moments of the abyss, when the world seems to be falling apart, what do they do? They buy the U.S. dollar, despite the fact that they have the, one of the worst... Um, 
like deficits Proje- out there. Projectories. Like projectories out yeah, there. Yeah. So I can't square that. So until until the world doesn't want U.S. dollars, it's always going to be a thing. Meaning when we're in a in a situation where the market's dropping out, you would expect Canada's currency to outperform the U.S. currency. But nine times out of ten, it doesn't when we when the uh, the shit hits, hits the fan, fan effectively. Yeah, you know? I think the, the one thing I like maybe speak to also the idea, um, this the big sort of um, debate in the bond market of deflation versus yeah, inflation, yeah. but yeah. really the sort of the deflationary headwinds that we're facing from a demographics, from right. a over indebtedness, and from technology really. Right. But there's the bond market is screaming deflation. Yeah, but. With some of the central bank activities, you're hearing people say, "Oh, they're printing money and there's inflation." And so, so but the bond yeah. market is selling you there's no inflation. Yeah. So I'm, I'll give you my view, and please add a couple points if I've missed some sure. some stuff yeah. because it's a big subject matter. I know both of us have have concentrated and researched and listened to many, you know, uh, analysts that are in the know, and there's a problem there because. What you would think is normally inflationary when you're basically throwing money into the system or almost helicopter money, you would think that there would be inflation at that point, but there certainly isn't. And the, the, the new thesis is that when you add on more debt levels at the private level, at the uh, business level, at the corporate level, and at the federal level, less so at the federal level, but more at the personal and corporate level, you start crowding out investment, and, and things get slower. So when you create a dollar out of no, uh, out of thin air, and throw it into the uh, in the economy, there should be. It, back in the day when it worked, you had a multiplier effect. You had, I'm making this up, but you had 1.5 times the debt that you threw in had created economic activity. And we've seen graphically and anecdotally that that. Um, that's number keeps dropping. So every dollar that goes in the system, it's now like maybe 10 years ago is, is 0.8. Now it's 0.6. Mm-hmm. So as you create more in debt, it actually is a trigger to slow down the economy because as everyone accumulates more debt, they have less purchasing power, even though rates are zero and you could, you can run your concurrent deficits easily, but you better hope that rates don't go up because then it'll, It'll tip the... Uh, yeah, it's almost like all that extra debt is just... it's You're throwing it on the economy's back, which then it's slowing it down even more, right. which then is even more deflationary. And so the question is, how do we get out of it? And I think it's, a, it's an issue that policymakers are it's dealing with right with, now and yeah. trying to get stimulus passed. Uh, but then the problem is... The you know the s- stimulus gets gets sort of caught in the political sausage making, and then it's one side wants this, one side wants this, and there's there's not this consensus to get things no, done. No, and you look at a lot of the velocity of money that equation. Yeah, well, and I, the velocity of money. Maybe you can explain what, yeah, a so, little bit. Yeah, so so like from a traditional macroeconomic perspective, um, the velocity of money is if you take um, uh, the sort of central bank m2 so m2 is the amount of money in, a, in, in an the economy system, in the economy yeah that then through the banking channel creates um a, you know a certain amount of money that actually then f- rotates through the system but if you were to, to sort of distill it all you take the size of the economy so gdp you divide it by that monetary base and it gives you uh, velocity of money and if you you know we'll put up a chart when we edit the podcast but the the chart has declined steadily since the 1990s and basically what it means is declining velocity just says a dollar in the economy is not turning over as fast as it did previously and so the problem is when you're trying to grow your economy out of it you could throw as much fiscal right. stimulus yeah. as you want in it, but that dollar is getting stuck in the system. And that and number, m- that multiplier has to be above one. And if it isn't above one, it becomes a, it becomes a, like a, just a heavier weight on everyone that they, they can't spend it out. They can't grow the economy because it's becoming less and less effective. Yeah, I think the other thing too, we can touch on this is interesting, is that so the central banks have created a lot of this base money in what they're doing. So quantitative easing, uh, where the Bank of Canada now and the Federal Reserve are buying bonds from the government and it's increasing their balance sheet. But those bonds are are not actually um, um, sort of a legal tender. They basically are an, uh, an instrument that sits within the banking system as, right. as bank reserves. 
especially especially in the U.S. But then the banks aren't lending them out because the environment is not great, and banks don't want to risk their own capital. Right. And so the problem is, you're throwing all this stimulus from a central bank and fiscal at the at the problem, but then that money just sits in the banking system. The banks say, "I'm not lending this out." Right. Interest rates are low. You're not risking your capital. So the problem is, you're, there's a log jam in the system. And there's a there was some initial talk, very premature, but. The initial talk of, of one day the Fed creating a digital currency and that where they can bypass the banks. Yeah, which would be, I mean, that would be a game changer yeah. because it, it flips normal monetary mechanisms on their head. And you're crushing and the banks in a way, I think, because you're becoming, they become less of a, 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 a flow of capital. Yeah, you're, you basically, you're saying the banks have become irrelevant. Yeah. So now we have to bypass the banks. And, uh, but that's like, that would be a rabbit hole to go down that I'm not sure policymakers are at that point yet, but it's, it's the problem is you, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are hurting. And so policymakers, both in Canada and the U S are trying to help people, which you can understand. The, The one thing you keep coming back to is this idea that governments everywhere have a huge revenue problem. And so there's also maybe speak to the idea of, you know, taxes going up and the impact that that would have on the economy, because that it seems yeah. like taxes have to go up. Well, and that's, of course, all what 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 happens in the election will have a significant impact on taxation, whereas uh, a Trump administration might tweak here and there and actually might raise things somewhere, but they're not going to raise a lot. Whereas certainly the Biden, they've already, he already came out and announced anyone making over Four hundred thousand dollars. They're going to increase the taxes. Now, from a Canada perspective, we would probably do better relative to the U.S. if they raise their corporate tax rate and they raise their middle class or their high. It might not be middle class, but their their wealth tax. Then it becomes more relatively more desirable to be in Canada because right now a lot of the money is flowing into the U.S. because their tax taxes taxes are so low. Yeah. The problem is they can't afford any. Like I just don't know how they're going to. My assumption is. Treasury is never paying back these deficits. And we got to figure out how to maneuver. And, and, and maybe you can talk, uh, uh, since we're on this specific talk, topic, maybe you can talk about the history of where we were when we actually were at 100% debt to GDP in the U.S. And there's actually a, a moment in history that they had to face this, and maybe you can explain it. I don't know if it's relative to today, but it might be. Yeah, I you know think- they say, what, history doesn't repeat but it, it rhymes. rhymes yeah i think we we've tried to go back now i mean we've spent the last year in part of our analysis sort of going back to historical analogs for what's happened before when interest rates have gotten to zero because it has happened the problem is you know most people are used to the regular business cycle where central bank eases policy lowers interest rates the economy then starts up again you know, then several years down the line you have a recession then they lower interest rates again but if you do that three or four times in a row if a central bank gets to zero, which is where we are right now. And so if you go back to uh, World War II was the last time, both, uh, especially in the U.S., that was 100% to GDP. It's where it is today per the uh, Congressional Budget Office uh, report that we were going through last week. But you've been at this level before, and what it took is a decade of uh, central banks keeping interest rates lower, pegging interest rates. So can you explain that uh, about pegging interest rates? Yeah, so really what it is, is, and you're actually, you've seen it in Japan uh, two, three years ago. Australia is actually doing it right now. But basically what, what it would entail is the central bank coming out and saying at certain parts across the interest rate curve, so let, let's just say the 10-year interest rate, the, the Federal Reserve would come out and say, we're going to issue all of this or the, the treasury is going to issue all this debt and the fed is not going to allow interest rates to go above 1% or, and then the 30 year bond, they might say, we're not going to let that go above 1.5%. Yeah. And so then that's the signal to the treasury to, you can issue unlimited amounts of debt and interest rates aren't going to go up. And so the problem is, you know, going back. And, and just uh, once again, an extension of that, it's not the interest rate problem it's the supply demand problem yeah, that so, forces interest rate up so yeah so I, so I, you know if you go back to a traditional framework for thinking about debt and interest rates if you're issuing a lot of bonds it's just a, it's a very simple supply demand if your supply goes up by 10x in terms of issuance naturally interest rates should go up because there's all those people have to buy those bonds and so the, the concern at this level is that there's so much debt out there and governments are going to try to respond to this with, with even more debt. So 
that would naturally push up interest rates, which then would hurt the consumer, would hurt housing, would hurt the stock market. Yes. So there's, and that so because of where we are in terms of debt levels, governments are going to say, well, we can't allow that. So I, I think the mirage of central bank independence is gone, yeah. and now they've basically combined themselves, and the central bank is helping, you know, the treasury, treasury fund themselves. Yeah. Um, so, but if you go back to the '50s when this happened, I think we've talked about this a little bit before too. Is you peg interest rates. Uh, cap them, you have relentless fiscal stimulus for a number of years. And then at the same time, you have, you know, from the population, there was huge savings rates. So savings rates of 30, 40% for a number of years. And, but what it did is it created a lot of inflation, all that fiscal stimulus. So it brought real interest rates deeply negative, right. which is a real interest rates are sort of a, a little bit of a bizarre concept for most people, but it's just, you know, whatever interest rate you see on your screen, Minus the inflation yeah, rate is the real right. rate. And so we're, I think our view is that we're heading into an environment where real rates are going to have to be taken negative and, and held negative. And then there's certain asset classes that will do well versus others. But, you know, a negative real rate environment with low interest rates is a very difficult environment for the bond market. Right. And so I think we're kind of grappling with that right now. And so maybe, maybe speak to, um, you know, having, you know, lowering the duration of the bond uh, portfolio yeah, yes. and and sort of you know the risk at the long end too. If, yeah. if, let's just say they don't cap rates yeah. and the, the the long end of the interest rate curve actually takes off on them. What that would look like? Yeah, and I mean this is the struggling of a bond manager in a sense. Uh, just a one last comment about what you're talking about is uh, just for our audience that in the fifties they there was true inflation and as as you had mentioned they kept uh, interest rate curve locked down. But then that crushes your value of your, if you're a holder of long bonds or 10-year bonds, by through inflation, it decreases the value of it and it, it monetizes almost the debt. And that's what the game that they were playing. They were at, they got on side, I think in the 1960s, where, where they were at 100% deficit GDP. They're now at, they were at now at 60 or something just yeah, because I, of inflation. I think by the 70s, it got down to 30 or 30, 40. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's what they did to the bondholders. Now, to answer your question, this is where we struggle, where I struggle, is we're sitting here with a large cash position, and it's strategically kind of there for a reason, but it, but it isn't in a way because just over the last several months, I've had so many bonds called on me, meaning they've matured and they've retired that I got to respend it. And it's, there's very little value out there to buy credit and there's very little value to buy governments, but I'm going to have to do something because the accounts aren't earning anything. So, so I'm going to have to spend something. I'm just going to probably keep the duration pretty low and uh, be pretty conservative on the spend because I want, I want in our bond portfolio bullets at another time where if the world does fall apart, high yield is going to fall apart with the stock market. And I want the bullets to buy that kind of thing. Yeah, I think the other thing on that, on that note, what's interesting still is that the Fed and the Bank of Canada are still involved in now buying corporate bonds, oh, which yeah. I think is, it's a... It's never been done. Yeah, it's, it's, and why they're still doing it at this point, like I can understand if you're a policymaker, why you just keep doing it because it's, you just want to keep the liquidity going. They're almost but, like addicted to it. It's almost, it's, you almost it's can't like stop. It's like a drug addict kind of addicted where they can't stop and they can't even signal they're going to stop even though they should stop because it's functioning now. But maybe also the, another thing to talk about is the issuance you've seen yeah. last six Massive months. Massive so, amounts so of corporate all, issuance. So, on the, so, so we buy issuer debt. Now, if you were a seller of issuer debt, meaning you're the actually issuer, how, if you had a balance sheet that was manageable, it was conservative. This is the greatest opportunity to issue long credit, whether it's 10 years, 30 years, and you're literally issuing corporate credit for like an, an a low bond, almost like a 10 year below 1% almost. So if you're talking one and one and a half percent, like my God, that, that is, that's almost free money. Yeah. And, and just the extension of it, the game that we're about to see in play and they've already started talking about the narrative. This is so. This is very dangerous in my view. Uh, the government, especially the liberal government in Canada, has basically been talking, saying, "Let's throw out uh, the debt to, to GDP calculation. Mm -hmm. It's no longer relevant," which is really scary. Yeah. What they're doing now is, what is the ongoing interest cost 
to GDP. Because if you have a debt to GDP go to say 100%, well, to them it doesn't matter because you're issuing credit or you're issuing government bonds at near zero or say 1% or even half a percent and your interest costs have crashed. Yeah. So on a apples to apples basis, it's actually lower than it was 10 to 20 years ago because we of course had to do funding we as in the Canadian government had to do funding at 7 8 10% and now they're doing funding at 1 that's great until it doesn't work anymore and then you're stuck with now that other equation where then all the credit agencies of the world say well you might have ignored it but we didn't ignore it and we're at you're now at 100% deficit to gdp a debt to gdp and we're going to downgrade you. And the problem is that's actually the big problem for Canada. We just got a whiff of a downgrade from Fitch, uh, but that's not really relevant because Fitch isn't really followed. And if it was S&P, it would be a bigger deal. Yeah. <laughs> that's just my comment, and I'm happy to say that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but that's a problem. And then you have to trust the government. They're going to rein in the spending. And that's the biggest issue going forward is, do you trust the government? Do you look the government in the, eyes, in the eyes and say, I totally understand what you're doing. I'll give you a pass. But in 2023, 2023 are you going to start bringing it in and stop spending? And I don't know that answer. Yeah, I think the biggest risk that I see is that it's very dangerous when you have governments recognize that their popularity is increasing or holding strong because yeah. they start handing things out. And especially if that's on the back end of issuing all this debt. And that's, I think the biggest concern that people have out there is just, just whether people are in the weeds every day following things or just, you know, reading the newspaper once a week and they see the headlines is that I know, I feel that most people realize it, it doesn't feel right and yeah. it doesn't feel sustainable. And it's this uneasiness that comes because there's, there's mission creep that happens. Yes. And once you're on that path, it's so hard to get off it. And I think that's sort of something that the markets are going to grapple with now well, for the next like just wait till years. the spring budget or whenever the budget's coming out in Canada. And for that matter, the U.S., they're going to throw in um, pet projects into this whole yeah, yeah. budget. They're going to throw everything in the kitchen sink and, and they're not going to be responsible. But the problem is they're incentivized not only from a political pers popularity perspective, but the market is, is basically saying you're okay to spend because what, what we look at every day is the risk premium on all sovereign debt. And the risk premium on Canada is, remember, is through the U.S., which appropriately should be, but no one seems to care. And then the uh, proxy for that, that feeling is how is your currency doing? And Canada's currency is doing just fine right now, even though they have current account deficits. Yeah. So, so I'm scared out of my mind because I'm ultra sensitive because I, I was a T-bill trader back in 95 and I, I, I knew what it was like to literally almost like, just, you know, you were there. Yeah, yeah, I was there. Yeah. So, so I'm really hoping we, we think wiser, but I would expect that, you know, you hope for the best and expect the, the worst, worst. And yeah. that's how we have to look at it. Yeah. So I, let's say if we're, if we're going to wrap up on a, on a, positive note yeah. <laughs> would you say i mean the don't talk to bond guys yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a problem it's a problem, a it's a problem having a bond negative. conversation yeah so w would you say um you know, i guess like we're in this relative game now where governments are sort of uh racing against each other to provide a stimulus but if you were if you were to throw a positive light on the environment and backdrop for canada and 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 how canada gets out of this there's there are things that we can do um and, and whether it's on a you know provincial spending on infrastructure we saw which is you know interesting yeah you know hopefully some of these positive things can get done but if you were going to say what well, what is Canada's way out of this situation in terms of s fiscal spending and what should the projects be put right. on to sort of lift the ship well out of this? let's even just talk about getting it done relative to not getting it done so we're here listening to the house and the senate and the president arguing about uh, a stimulus package where Canada has a system where even in even we don't have a majority government but we can get the stimulus package much quicker because mm -hmm. of our political um, apparatus in a sense which is also more dangerous but because there's very there's no checks and balances yeah. but even then the positives of Canada is one we get it done we're, we're, we're releasing funds we tend to be looking at infrastructure 
We don't have this political bent about not funding states that are against. Yeah, we're not fighting a culture war. Exactly, exactly. So that's helped. And that's the extension of our bullishness is that we are, uh, we're very progressive in our country, which is, is really great for immigration. And you will, if you're an economist, if you're a, a, a money manager, you, you really can't have the attitude of you don't like immigration. Immigration is very good because it adds, on general, 1% debt to G, 1% of GDP growth every year. Yeah. And, and it adds a, dyna- a dynamic to, it adds youth to, an old, we're, we're all aging out, yeah. right? Look at the extension of Japan. This goes back to the comment of Japan. Is like, I just don't get Japan because their demographics are horrible. Their average age is someone like 65. They're not accepting immigration. Uh, it's going to eventually tip over for them. For us, we have these issues as well, but we have immigration, and we have about uh, uh, because of the virus, it, it's collapsed in immigration. But we used, we used to get it. We get about four hundred thousand people uh, uh, a year, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's that dynamic helps. We're getting way more tech jobs. I don't know if I ever will believe the productivity numbers in Canada because they've always lagged, and I don't know if they've calculated properly. And and even uh, experts and journalists also have a kind of hint of this just does, does, doesn't make sense because it's never, we've never had productivity. Yeah. And that would mean your wealth of your country drops and we've only had a wealthier country yeah. uh, over the last 20 years. So anyway, those are all positives. And, and actually, the most basic level, which is functioning better? Which government is functioning better? The Canadian government, the provincial government, they're all aligned. This through this is tells you that through the virus and the crisis, yeah. provincial and federal government worked cohesively together. In the U.S., it was the opposite, and that's the problem. So, so from Canada on a relative scale, we should do better. It's just I don't think anyone notices us in the global yeah, wealth kind of- map. We they just throw our throw the two or three percent to Canada and don't really think about it that much. Yeah. Well, so why don't we wrap it up on yeah. that and then we can uh, look forward to the next conversation. Sure, that was great. Thanks. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. You can find us on avenueinvestment.com where you can learn more about the topics discussed today at our blog or subscribe for updates to our content. You can also follow us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.